if law enforcement and the victims of crime see atrocities in the field, the prosecutors have to live that because they're the ones that have to prosecute those cases. And that's something to think about. They see all the all the gruesome sides. Of Sometimes unseen. Vicarious Sometimes trauma, they, endless. Of endless. endless. And, and they're on homicide duty. When there's a homicide in this community, they're out on the scene with the police, helping them search warrants, whatever they need. Today, we discuss the intersection between mental health and the Florida State Attorney's Office specifically the 11th Circuit Court. Uh, with us, we have Honorable Catherine Fernandez Rundle. How are you, ma'am? I am awesome. It's just the way you just talk to each other about how great it is to be with each other. Just imagine how I feel, because I get the two of you here today. Thank you. Madam State Attorney, we'd like to get right into it, right? Um, we're discussing about mental health, right? And the struggles that not just the public has, but our own brethren, if you will, mm -hmm. have. We encounter a lot of it. Ma'am, you run, without doubt, the largest state attorney's office in the state of Florida, mm -hmm. probably in the region. Mm -hmm. You have a, a whole bunch of state attorneys, the state attorneys that work for you. You see an incredible amount of cases. How are you dealing with the stress? Well, first of all, let me just thank you and you for your service. I knew both of you in service in different capacities. And uh, the public can really be proud of you. I was. I enjoyed working with both of you, and I was proud of the work that you did. Thank you. Um, so the state attorney's office, for those that don't know, uh, is, is like the fourth or fifth largest, depending on what's going on at the day, largest in the United States. We're essentially about 1,200 employees, 350 lawyers when fully staffed. Uh, obviously, the other 800 are support staff, victim witness counselors, investigators, mm -hmm. uh, paralegals, uh, in interpreters. So, and we are in nine buildings. Um, and we handle upwards of tens of thousands of cases every year in terms of felonies and misdemeanors. We're also really the prosecutor, if you like, for all of the police departments. I know both of you know that, but you know there are 35, I think, police departments in, in Miami-Dade County. Miami County. Uh, Dade County is the largest mm -hmm. municipality, but we have to serve all those others, and they're all so different. You know, the way Hialeah feels is much different from the way Miami Beach feels and, and so on, so Florida City from Aventura. So it's a big county with a lot of responsibility. And I'm just so proud to work with the men and women that I do. The other thing that we do that a lot of people don't know is that we're the only state attorney's office in Florida that does child support enforcement. And so you may say, well, what's a prosecutor doing that for? Well. It's because we believe in anything we can do to prevent crime and to help children. Okay. And so the children need to get the wherewithal to survive in this very complicated world. Otherwise, they won't be able to compete. And we all know what happens if you don't have engaged, constructive young people in society. We collected in just the last, I think it's seven years, $1 billion. Isn't that incredible for the, the children of Miami-Dade County? That also sets another story, right? That there's a lot of deadbeat parents out there. Yeah, yeah. yeah there's upwards about 70,000 cases. So, David, I know you've got a bunch of questions, but let's go into the the, the struggles of, of your staff. Because mm -hmm. from there, we'd like to go into the services that your office provides. How are they dealing with the stress? Because I know the state employees, state assistant state attorneys are lower than paid than the average private sector attorney. We know we lived in a high cost metropolitan area. We know economy, you know, life is hard. So how do they deal it with it? It really the is, Robert. I, I mean, sometimes when I when they come to say they have to go, they come with tears in their eyes. And you know, that's that's really unforgivable that the state of Florida doesn't recognize these wonderful public servants that, and you know, some people say, oh, well, they're getting good experience. They are, but you know, they're also making a sacrifice for it. And they need a reasonable wage, a livable wage. And so the stress, so let me, uh, let me just back up a couple, because there are a couple layers of stress. So one is you have COVID catch up. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we were closed and we opened, we weren't, we weren't, we had to, you know, get, uh, you know, 1,200 computers out to people's homes. 
they were stressed at home. They were stressed with children, uh, their partners, whoever they may be, dogs, everybody cooped in. But then they had to handle all these cases. Then when the courts really opened, and I mean, not they were they'll say they were open, they were on Zoom and things, but cases weren't moving. Then what happens? COVID ends, and all the backload of thousands of cases were in the wings, just waiting. And while that's happening, as you know, there is this confluence of all, so New York, and it's great, Miami became a wonderful hotspot. Mm -hmm. So they moved from all over the country here. They were from Chicago, they moved from New York. Some of it had to do with the COVID and being cooped in and they wanted to be outside. Some of it had to do, um, you know, with, with salaries and crime, and we could talk a little bit about that. But the end result was they ended up here, a lot of them. So that's good news for a lot of us, mm -hmm. but that made it really even harder on these lawyers and the rest of the support staff. So what happens? Business booms, real estate's on fire. So that means all the private law firms now, they wanna hire people. They're anxiously waiting to hire people and you don't even have to go to court. You don't even have to come into the office. You can roll out of bed in your pajamas or sweatpants or whatever you prefer and just get on a, some kind of a Zoom, right? anything virtual and you're ha handling a client and you're gonna get paid three times more than what the state of Florida says you're gonna get paid to live in the same community, to do very important work, mm -hmm. but you're gonna handle far more cases. So you have the stress of the cases, then you have the stress of, should I go private? My wife wants me to, my mother thinks they should, you know? You have family members that are telling you, what are you doing, you know? You're, you're overworked, you're stressed out. Now you gotta get dressed, you gotta go through traffic, you gotta get down to the courthouse, and now there's fewer of you. Mm -hmm. So not only do you have the backload of cases, your colleagues now are leaving, and now there's nobody at the podium. I use that, you know, very broadly speaking, because for the public to understand every single morning, with the exception of some holidays, we are standing in court as prosecutors with a judge, with victims and witnesses and criminal defendants and victims that are dying to get their case done, police officers that are lined up, ready to testify. And that prosecutor is the one that's really the centerpiece. Everybody relies on that prosecutor. And what ha is happening, which is very sad, is that lawyer now has very little experience because as people left, we had to move people. And just to give you an example of numbers, I think I mentioned at the onset of the show that we went fully staffed. We're slotted for 350 lawyers. That means that's what our workload depends on. Well, we've lost 152 lawyers in just two years and 250 support staff in, in the same amount of time. So that means we're at 33% vacancy rate so who's handling those cases? Mm -hmm. Who's handling those cases are younger, inexperienced, not the youth alone, but they're inexperienced. They're handling rape cases. They're handling armed robbery cases, carjacking cases, attempted murder cases, cases that you both know from the street are very, can be very complicated. And it's even more so now, in a good way for the case, there's body cameras everywhere. There are security circuit court, you know, I mean, closed circuit TV, video. So those lawyers all have to study all of that, come up to speed on it. They have to screen through it. They have to get ready to present that. So their workload by case and by qu quantity of each case has exponentially grown. And what's very sad to come to another conclusion is the victims, the victims have to tell their story over and over again. If you're a rape victim, how many, and I've had mothers say that to me. I had a mother whose daughter was killed in a, in a vehicular manslaughter case. You know how terrible those are. And she looked at me and she sat in my office, sort of like where you are, Robert. And she was crying, but she was composed. And she looked at me and she says, you know, I like you. I like your office. I like all the lawyers I had. But I've had seven lawyers on my daughter's case. It's taken 
12 years. Why? And that's not fair. That's not justice. That is an unfair outcome for everybody. And for the community at large, it's unfair. And it really puts public safety at risk because you haven't held that person, whoever it may be, and I'm not just on the vehicular manslaughter case, but whatever criminal case. And, you know, they haven't been freed and they haven't been held accountable. And so they just linger there and they're in the community. And last but not least, I want you to think about how that relates to gun violence. And I know you'll both appreciate this because you were, you've been out there. You've seen it firsthand. If I witness a killing in my neighborhood and I know who did it, but I'm afraid to tell anybody. I'm not going to tell anybody. And, I, and why is that? Because I don't think he's going to go to jail. I think he's going to be right there down the street, either gets arrested and back out again, or they're never going to really arrest him. And I'm going to be at risk and my family. So you know what happens? They stay quiet. And some of those cases are what the police, as you know, call unfounded. Mm -hmm. They're never able to arrest anybody. So that means that shooter and that gun is still out on the street, terrorizing some neighborhoods. So, I, did, I mean, I could go on about this. Um, Very interesting. David, you, you've been doing some research. What, what, well, what do you have to say here? You know, it makes 100% uh, makes common, it's not common sense. It, it, it's a sound point. Absolutely correct. Speaking from retired law enforcement with, with decades in, yeah, the problems are, are the problems. And how do we fix to, uh, to correct them? But I want to take a sidestep, perhaps. Mm -hmm. uh, we had on uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Carlos Martinez, mm -hmm. and we talked about some of the, you know, on a different side, but some of the issues he goes through with his personnel, and some of them almost mirror. So I know you're talking about the stresses of those that want to leave, perhaps, and they, you know, the wife's saying, go ahead and leave, go private, go private. What about the stressors now on those younger ones that say, oh, my God, he's leaving? Or it's almost like the cop. You know, everybody mm -hmm. left the unit. You're the only one now. You got your weekends off. Uh, now you got to go to a different shift and everything. Your whole life you know, is turned upside down. Mm -hmm. So you got the stressors now that are coming on these younger attorneys uh, where the more experience has left. Uh, how are they handling it besides the workload? I'm talking about from the mental point of view because it, it does catch up and there's studies back, you know, from about five, six years ago on, on, on attorneys and the concerns, not just state attorneys or public defenders, all attorneys and the stressors they go through and how they handle it. So I'm, I was just curious, how are they coming along on, in that from that standpoint? Well, you know, it, it's it's it can be really frightening. Mm -hmm. And I'm really glad you brought it up because I do think it's, you know, the mental health, the well-being of these professionals is in question to some extent. Of course, everyone, all everyone feels stress, some greater than others mm -hmm. and some ne never get a reprieve. Some people can seek therapy, which is a good thing. Others either can't afford it or there's a shame factor or a stigma. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, it's interesting because Carlos Martinez, the public defender, and, and I actually have an excellent working uh, relationship. Part, we're good partners. We don't agree on all things, nor are we supposed to. Mm -hmm, yeah. and, but we hi, hi, hold each other in high regard. But all of our lawyers are really stressed. And you made the statement early, all lawyers to some extent, are at risk of mental well-being. And the Florida Bar, of which we all have to be a member mm -hmm. um, in order to practice, uh, it has been actually focused on this issue for lawyers. I don't have the numbers with me. They're easily obtainable. Mm -hmm. You could just probably go to the Florida Bar website. But they have done studies and surveys on, you know, abusive substances which oftentimes is just a form of self-medication, right. right? You stress, you just, or there's depression, uh, it, which is another potential outcome if you don't take care of stress. Uh, and, you know, lawyers are like human beings. They go through divorce and death and family loss and, you know, economic stress and all those kinds of things everybody else does. Uh, and they've really focused on this for lawyers. Um, because the rate among our profession, I understand, is higher than most or a lot of other professions. Mm -hmm. 
And so they've talked about depression, mental illness, suicide, um, as, I, as I mentioned, substance abuse issues, dual diagnosis. Uh, for lawyers. So I think if you take just the general population, like you mentioned, of lawyers, and then you add this public forum where so much is dependent on you, whether you've got one person, which is the defendant mm -hmm. for Carlos and his lawyers, or you're the prosecutor and there's a whole bunch of stresses on you from all different places. We just talked a, a lot about it. Sometimes there's a victim that's depending on you. Sometimes there's a whole family that's defending on you as the prosecutor and the judge, mm -hmm. but it starts with the prosecutor before the judge can really do anything. We call ourselves the gatekeepers on the cases that get into the system. And that whole family is relying on you to protect them. Sometimes it's just to seek justice, but sometimes it's more than that. You, you know, this bad man has been yeah. hurting mommy or whatever the situation may be for a long time, sexually assaulting a young child in the family. You know, you also, uh, well, this sort of mirrors law enforcement as well. The things you're talking about, you can plug law enforcement right into that. And you said two things that have, have been uh, interwoven through our shows, stigma and the strength to seek help. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's something that we talk about. But also what you and Carlos have in common, albeit from other sides, and, and praise to you both how you work together mm -hmm. and how you deal with mental illness on the people you come in mm -hmm. touch with. For the prosecutors and the public defenders, that's that's quite interesting. Can you tell us about that a little? Yeah, bit? and that, and now that's really that that's been wonderful to uh, bre you know to break into that frontier mm -hmm. because um, you know when I was growing up to go back to the stigma and keep it hush hush and quiet. If if you had someone in your family, which I we all have, mm -hmm. I had uh, that had men that had or has mental health issues, you were supposed to keep quiet about it. You weren't supposed to talk about it. And so a lot of people grew up with that. And so therefore, if you felt that way too, not, not if it's just somebody in your family, but if you were feeling that way or somebody was telling you, you, you know, I think you're depressed, the, the thought of reaching out for help was just something you didn't do. Mm -hmm. Now we've kind of like broken through that glass, right? And we, we all get, no, 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 on the contrary. Um, and it includes us as professionals, although I think we're probably still a little bit backward in that respect in terms of shame or stigma or whatever may be attached to it. But people coming in the system, mm. so the people that are getting, not all people, many people who get arrested really have either, can have a mental health issue, can have real mental illness issues, which lead to chronic homelessness, a dual diet, you know, substance abuse, and the homelessness comes with abandonment. They, their families got tired sometimes. They don't want anything to do with them anymore. And so it just becomes this cycle that you just, and they get arrested, they get into the system, and then they, they're back on the street. Now the police have to pick them up again. And not, the police don't even want to do that mm -hmm. sometimes. Mm -hmm. I mean, they, they know what they're looking at. Sometimes it's a veteran, which yeah. if we get to talk about yeah. that, um, you know, so we, so what did we do? So we in the system, having under, having better insight and understanding into mental illness and how it impacts the criminal justice system, it just made sense. It just was smart justice to do something tangible about it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it starts with leadership. And for us in Miami-Dade County, now in Florida, it was a judge named Steve Leifman. It was another judge, Tom Peterson, who's since passed. Mm -hmm. God rest his soul. God rest his soul. Yes. Juvenile. Huh? And juvenile. And juvenile. Yes, he was, yes, a, he yes. was always a pioneer. Yep. Yep. Uh, he started really juvenile court for mm -hmm. defendants anyway. So there were those, you know, those were the insightful people that understood that there was a dynamic, there was a criminogenic need that needed to be addressed. And you can't just do it one way. It had to be systemic. It had to be holistic and everybody had to buy into it. So we have done that uh, in this circuit. And I think Steve's getting it, you know, Judge Leifman's getting that done in a lot of other circuits now as they become more enlightened. So we now have a track. Okay. It isn't complete. We're constantly building on it. And Robert touched upon, he was trying to help 
this new facility that hopefully will open. We've all been waiting for it to open for a couple of years now. And he supported it, and we thank you for that. Um, but, you know, it, we now have a track within the court system mm -hmm. for misdemeanors, like some of the right. chronic homeless, um, petty thieves, uh, loitering prowling folks. That just means, you know, DUI, not DUI driving, not really wouldn't necessarily fall into that category, but maybe just uh, drinking in public. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, but remember, homeless people don't have a backyard to go drink in, so they do it on the street. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying it's reality. So they come into the system, and now we fast track them. We look and see. We do an assessment on them. What are your needs? We do an evaluation, and if they qualify, even even in jail, there is a uh, a jail track mm -hmm. for mental health. So if someone gets arrested, they can be screened right then and there. Public defender, prosecutors, family members mm -hmm. can call up and say, "My guy, my brother, sister is in jail." But he's re he really has a mental health issue. He's got medication. Can you make sure that they get immediately screened? And if they qualify, they go into a special court calendar, if you like, with a judge that understands the dynamics, understands treatment, and then we get him into treatment. I think the interesting thing to point out here is that, you know, I've always looked at your office as being the part of the justice system that has to thread the needle, right? Mm -hmm. You're prosecuting the cases that law enforcement brings to you, the good cases, right? Um, because there's a lot of criminal activity and we, we're not being soft on crime, we're just talking about the reality here. You're prosecuting cases. You're also serving victims' rights, or right? Mm -hmm. And then you have to balance with the resources you have, which at times are very difficult because as you pointed out, nearly 50% of your office from my count mm -hmm. has left. Yeah. You know, you had a turnover. Uh, you have some constraints, economic constraints, budgetary constraints from the state. You know, but the interesting thing is, and, and here's something to point out, we see a lot of crimes on TV, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's how most of us get our news. Yeah. Whether it's, we don't have to go into specifics, but yeah. the 13-year-old who right. kills his mother or the public official, school board member, who goes out in shopping spree yeah. on tax dollars, do, tax at tax the expense dollars. of the tax dollars. Mm -hmm. You're dealing with those cases. Yes. But, you know, we started the show because we want more answers. And seeking greater answers and better understanding, I can't help but to come back and say, darn it, the stress on your office has mm -hmm. to be through the roof. Yeah. And you mentioned about the Florida Bar now supporting lawyers' wellness, attorneys' wellness. What are the programs that are working for your office? Are they similar? Do they do, are they similar to what you just mentioned about the Smart Program for the for the defendants, if you will? For our lawyers, we see it. They have breakdowns. Now, you know, for those that are watching, the overwhelming majority of them are very strong. And they're no, determined. They're that's, that's yeah. We're talking no, about. I it's, know. It's the reality of it's what, the reality. what we suffer as human beings, right? Right. They're only human. They're human f crime fighters in the courtroom. They're advocates. Mm -hmm. And they do absorb a lot of the pain and stress that victims and police officers feel when they come in. So we do have special, we call them employee tracks. And so they know who to go with in our office. We work with them. We encourage them. Sometimes we can tell. Sometimes it's a trigger like a family member died, mm -hmm. right? And it just puts them into a deep depression. It's, big. it's a big deal. Um, and so we know that and we'll work with them. And we say, look, take some time off. One should go get well. Take whatever time you need. Because that, in order for them to serve this community well, they need to be well. And so we recognize that. And I, and I think... I think that they feel free, you know, coming to us. I hope so. Mm -hmm. You know, you never know if people leave for other reasons and that you don't know. But I feel I feel pretty good about it that they know we have that ready for them. Wow. The way how, how the culture's changing, yeah. right? Now we're talking about it, yeah. which is great. And we're dealing with it. David, you, well, you we call it thoughts. Again, we call it a strength. It's not a weakness. Mm -hmm. And, you know, kudos to those at the top of the organizations that see it and allow 
uh, for the assistance to be had if needed. You know, something that jumped out, and it's an interesting stat, moving aside a little bit, Miami-Dade County has the highest percentage of individuals suffering from mental health problems of any urban area within the United States. That's fascinating. You know, in a way, I understand it. So why do, so why do I say that? I think there's an increase in people wanting to be here. Our growth population has almost trebled in the last couple of years, last decade or so. And if you think about it, we know, at least from the last time I looked, homelessness grows during the winter months. Yes. So does. we also unfortunately know that there's a large portion of our our homeless that are are chronically mentally ill and nobody's been able to help them or deal with them or provide for them and they do tend to move around and sometimes they don't want help. We we all know that. So that's number doesn't surprise me. I I want to add something to something you said that day because I I I want the the um you know the audience to understand that I, it's not just from my perspective as your state attorney because I have my role as your state attorney that's my job right you 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 trust me to do what I have to do to keep the community safe so to me to have specialized tracks you know mental health tracks to have a drug court track, to have a domestic violence specialty, to have a drug court, the first one in the country, mm -hmm. to have one for veterans yes. that are coming home yeah. and yep. triggers with PTSD. It, those tracks to deal with the underlying criminogenic needs that we just talked about, the only way you're gonna stop, in my view, and we're talking about nonviolent for the most part, right? Mm -hmm. it, the only way you're gonna stop recidivism and re-victimization is through fixing it. You're not gonna be able to incarcerate your way out of that particular type of individual. You're gonna see them a lot, and it's gonna come rotating in and out, but my view is every time you do that, you're, you're usually victimizing somebody else. So I would rather, uh, and that's why we call it smart justice for these mm -hmm. type of offenders, most of them wanna be constructive. Uh, they, a lot of them don't want to be a problem. They want to be part of the solution and not the problem. So jails really are not the place for those with mental health issues. I mean, no, I think it we really all agree isn't. with that. And we can go back for to minor criminal offenders. For minor, for minor yes, of course. But we can go back to speech that I researched as a as a history uh, major. Uh, John Kennedy, August of 63, says the exact same thing in a speech a couple months before oh, he died. Really? Jails are not the place for those with mental issues. Yeah, it's fascinating. That's interesting. It took us that long. Took, I was, that was my next, yeah. was my next comment. Well, but better late than never. The criminal justice system has to focus on alternative pathways, what we've been talking about, for some people, for the nonviolent offenders who can be fixed. That's what I call smart. But then we must incarcerate those, and we must focus on the worst of the worst, and, and th those that we must. And so when you, I believe, have that kind of combination of an approach to public safety, then every, it's a win-win for everybody. And so we're down to like the last two or three minutes of the show, and and it's really important to sh to, to, to emphasize what you just said. Look, we know we're a destination choice for many across the globe, not just the country, but across the globe. But sadly, with that attraction, we have no shortage of crime. Right. But what we have fortunate to this part of the country is that what we have is a partnership amongst our law enforcement mm -hmm. communities. And that in itself, I, I credit for keeping the crime in some level of control because we know Anybody's ever been a victim, we know there's no shortage of predators, there's no shortage of criminals out there, there's no shortage of somebody's going to try to take it from you mm -hmm. if they can. Um, Madam State Attorney, I'm going to turn it over to my partner here, but but I can't thank you enough for coming and, and being honest because I think you've been very honest with us about sharing you know, the, the feelings that or the sentiment of your office and what they're going through. Um, it's it's an incredible challenge, and I, and I think it's an honorable job what your prosecutors do. What are the words of encouragement for the public that they can help you and help your prosecutors 
um, maybe advocate for y'all? Well, first of all, thank you for allowing me to, to come and, and talk about the wonderful men and women that really work at the Dade State Attorney's Office. They, they're they my heroes, they, and they know it. They, I call them the best team in America, and they are. And they, they love serving this community. Don't misunderstand me for a second. They want to. And if you want to support them uh, as members of the community, just like you have, you've given them a voice today. You gave them a voice today. People could get a little feeling of how they felt, how they feel every day. Uh, it would be to call your legislators. Um, right now, it's the legislature's in session. 99% of the budget of the state attorney's office, your state, this is your state attorney's office. That's for all 67 counties in the state of Florida. That's correct. That's where everybody is right now. And they will be there till mid-March, I believe it is. And they're deciding how to spend a billions and billions of dollars uh, that, that are in Florida's coffers, if you like, in their overall budget. And we're not asking for a lot. We're asking for just a, a really a livable, reasonable wage so that men and women can stay local, live local, and be your crime fighters to keep your community safe. So thank you both, gentlemen. I appreciate it. Write your legislators. Thank you. David? Just a world of respect for for you and, and your office and the work you you all do, and and to, to have that that wisdom too of 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 the different uh, areas that you talked about with smart, and and tackling those issues, the underlying causes. Mm -hmm. That's half the battle, and and that's why you're having the successes you're having. I feel and and kudos to you and your and your team. Thank you. Thank you and thank you for your service in law enforcement. Well, on that note. Um, this has been another show. Rachel, our producer behind the scenes, thank you. The Millers, Michael Grant Miller, and the community news team, we thank you the same. But most importantly, you, the audience, we can't thank you enough. See you next time.